Hey everyone, what's up? This is Dr. Charlie Johnson, physical therapist, and this video is gonna be perfect for you if you have been told you have sciatica, or maybe you really do have sciatica. Uh, back pain, butt pain, leg pain, numbness, and tingling caused by a herniated disc, spinal stenosis, arthritis in your spine, uh, piriformis syndrome, and you're having trouble doing all the classic things like sitting and driving and bending and lifting and all that stuff, uh, and you want to learn how to solve this problem naturally, and you're interested in understanding why you need to do what you need to do, and why your problem isn't going away versus just what to do. So if you're just looking for a quick fix here, this video is not for you. If you're looking to understand really in depth what's happening and how to solve it, continue to stick around. We're gonna review the case of a woman named Dee who had sciatica for over a year and tried almost everything, uh, many different things, uh, and doctors completely missed the boat. And so I would hate for you to miss the boat as well as I break down this case even though you are not D, ask yourself, how can I take these concepts and principles that Charlie is sharing and apply them to my own unique situation? So stick around, check it out, and let me know your thoughts below in the comments. All right, everyone, so some quick statistics before we dive into the case review so you know who I am, what I do, and why you might be interested in hearing what I have to say. Uh, I definitely don't know everything, but my knowledge and experience as a doctor of PT, orthopedic board specialized, residency trained, and only someone who treats back, butt, and sciatica issues, uh, this places me at top 0.5%. Uh, statistically of other PT providers here in the U.S. So that being said, uh, I'm in the trenches working with people like you every single day. So take the nuggets, take the concepts and apply them to your specific case. All right. So here we go. Sciatica pain, a uh, case study of a woman named D, mind versus body. So we're going to review the entire case, which involves three elements, the location of symptoms, the specific story, as well as the movement exam. And I challenge you to sort of plays D's story with your specific story. And even if your case isn't exactly like D's, uh, there's probably some things you can resonate with. Okay, So you can go through all these specific motions, you can record the results of them, you can uh, you know, listen to these answers that she's provided and ask yourself, hey, do I relate to that or not? Uh, and my guess is if you have some type of back butter sciatic problem, then the location of symptoms is probably fairly similar. So let's dive into it. Location of symptoms, story, response to movement exam. And we are going to go through this step by step because as you'll see, all of this informs us as to the cause. So we're going to determine the problem, ruling out big, ugly, scary things, IDing the source, mind versus body within the body. Well, what could be going on? Uh, it could be many different sources of symptoms, disc problems, SI joint problems, hip problems, piriformis problems, all kinds of things. By the way, if you're interested in determining the most likely source of your symptoms and would like to have access to this diagnostic algorithm, then be sure to download my Better Than an MRI DIY Diagnostic Guide. You can download that by clicking the link above or somewhere in the description. All right, so let's dive into it. We're also going to talk about the solution as well. And so one thing you'll learn is that sometimes the fixing is in the doing. Sometimes you have to go through the process. You have to fall off the bike so that you can learn what really you need to do moving forward. All right, so Take the concepts, let's apply them, and let's dive in. So D's case, this is where D experiences pain. And again, it's probably very similar for you. So some back pain, or maybe you don't have any back pain, that's okay, but you have buttock pain and maybe some leg pain, numbness and tingling. In this case, it's only on her left side. Keep in mind, again, even if your symptoms look slightly different than this, or your story is slightly different, the same principles and concepts apply. And this is why I want to dive into it deep for you. This is... D's case. I said everyone who's interested in potentially working with us submits a detailed case review, gives me all the info I need to confirm if we can help, how we can help. Let's go step by step through it. And again, uh, go ahead and sort of maybe fill out your own case review uh, and answer these own questions for yourself and apply the concepts. All right. So D is a female in her 50s. All right. So I asked, where do you hurt? Well, we already saw that back and left glute and going down left leg. How long has D been in pain since November of 2023? At the time of submitting this case, it was April 2024. So almost a year and a half. What originally caused her pain? She's unsure if episodes are combined. She says a 17 hour long flight may have been the possible cause of her first episode. Maybe an exercise program and restarting that after a year and a half break. Maybe that was possibly the cause of her second and third episode. And these words, unsure, possible, possible, maybe, all this stuff uh, is really important when it comes to determining the most likely source of your symptoms. So if you're not sure as to what caused your symptoms, then did something really happen? And what does that mean? Hmm. So what if any diagnostic tests have been performed? She had an x-ray where they had her bend forward and bend backwards to check for any type of like instability in the spine. Those didn't seem to show much, but she was told that she had lumbosacral spondylosis, which is arthritis with radiculopathy, radiculopathy being uh, like a pinched nerve, right? And as you'll see here in a moment, she already tells us in her case review that she does not have radiculopathy. More on that in a moment. She was recommended some PT 
uh, pills, stuff like that, and then an MRI to uh, further try to figure out. So even though she was diagnosed with this, they're not really sure. And they say, well, maybe there's stenosis at the lumbosacral L5-S1 level. She went to the GP, maybe a muscle issue. The only tool you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. And so of course, if the GP orders x-rays and doesn't really know much about back problems, nothing against them, they're GPs for a reason, uh, then they will say, hey, you, you need x-rays or you have a muscle issue. And so if you have a muscle issue, well then let's give you muscle relaxants to see what happens. And oh, by the way, I don't really know what I'm doing. So can you go to the chiropractor? And so she goes to the chiropractor and the chiropractor suggests that she has a locked SI joint. And that just makes sense. Again, depending upon who you see will determine what you're told is wrong with you and the treatment that you get. And this is the way generally, generally, uh, chiropractors kind of view things as sort of a subluxation, more bony misalignment type of issue. Now, what do doctors or specialists believe to be a source of the pain? Well, they don't really know. Do you have a consistent day-to-day -day pain? She says, I've had good days and bad days. By the way, if you're watching this, you have some type of back butt or sciatic issue. If you have good days, then you can have more good days. You just need someone to help you like we're going to do today. And like we did for D, put together the pieces of the puzzle to figure out what about what you're doing or what you're not doing is creating those good days. And then obviously what is creating the bad days. So we can study these peaks, good days, and these valleys, bad days, and really figure out what's going on. Do you have delayed pain? Nope. Does your pain shifter spread or move around? Uh, it didn't, but now it has a little bit since starting chiropractic stuff. I ask questions about the psychology of pain. Does stress influence your pain? Yes or no? She says no. Being distracted influence your pain? No. Any significant life event? No. Um, what things make you worse? Sitting tying her shoes, trying to put on her socks, straightening the left leg while sitting and bending at the waist. What makes you feel better? There was general exercises early on that helped uh, and now not as much, but she's using some CBD stuff and some ice. Now we have people go through a total body scan. I believe that you watching this know better what you're feeling than I do. And so uh, we have you go through some different motions and rate what you experience. And we're really looking for motions that make you feel yucky or reproduce your symptoms. So you can see here, this is the self-movement exam. This is the total body scan. So we have people go through a trunk twist on the right side, left side, knee to chest, right, left, figure four, leg raise, forward bend, backwards bending, all of that fun stuff. So then we can get an idea of what their sensitivities are or are not. And you can see here on the left side of the body, she's pretty much got all yucky motions and bending forward and backwards also is problematic. Now, I talked about radiculopathy earlier. Radiculopathy uh, appears as though people are just throwing around this term without any type of uh, support for it. Because radiculopathy is really defined as an objective motor or sensory loss. And so if nerves are like highways and carry information such as feeling and movement, then if you pinch that nerve or you compress that nerve and cause a radiculopathy, then you would see an objective loss of feeling and or strength. And you can see here that she walks on her heels, which assesses the function of the L5 nerve because those muscles help you lift up uh, your toes. And she does not have foot drop. She can walk on her heels. We have her go up on her toes and do some calf raises. And this assesses the health of the S1 highway or nerve root. And we can see that all those neural networks are working or appear to be working just fine because she can do that without issues. Uh, she doesn't have any permanent numbness or tingling, no loss of bowel or bladder control, and therefore radiculopathy, just based off her story and a basic movement exam, uh, is essentially ruled out. We don't have any evidence to suggest that this nerve is being pinched and that there's an objective muscle strength loss or feeling sensory loss. So there is no radiculopathy here. Maybe her nerve's irritated, but there is no pinching or compression of it. She does have a previous history of cancer. We asked this as a screening question, as you'll see here in a moment. A previous history of cancer is uh, most predictive of uh, future cancer and or cancer being the cause of this back issue. Good news is, though, she was diagnosed recently with uh, the skin cancer, and so she is under current monitoring for that, and it seems like they're taking care of it. Trying other things, nothing's really working. Uh, can't do the things that she wants. Pain's constantly on her mind. Pain at some point becomes more than just a physical reality. It becomes something that uh, psychologically can become very, um, you know, stressful. And so uh, there's too much information. Maybe you're watching this right now and you're like, I don't know what to do, what not to do. Uh, and she's lost. So you can sense a little bit of desperation in her voice. She's frustrated. She can't do things she wants to do. She's constantly preoccupied by this issue. She's lost, frustrated. Uh, there's a lot of information and she just doesn't know where to turn. She says also she's at a pivot point. There's like this critical high pressure sort of uh, phase of her recovery that she's in right now. And she's not progressing with chiropractic treatment. 
oh, by the way, I thought the chiropractor said it was an SI joint issue. Now they're saying it might be scar tissue. And so you can see how nobody really knows what they're doing or knows what's going on. Doctor did order an MRI. Um, why? I have no clue. Uh, and she already knows what I'm going to say about this. So let's dive into now the self-movement exam. We already share with you her results of this, but I would ask that you go through this as well. So do a trunk twist right one time and a trunk twist left one time. And after doing just one rep, I would ask that you would rate uh, and determine which of these motions, if any, are yucky. And when I say which motions are yucky, go ahead and score the yucky motion. So you do a trunk twist right, one rep, a trunk, trunk twist left, one rep. And is that trunk twist yummy or is it yucky? And are symptoms low, medium, or high? And you could do this for all of these motions on the right and left side of the body. Trunk twist, knee to chest, figure four, leg raise, forward bend, uh, forward bend center to the right side over your right knee, to the left side over your left knee, backwards bend, straight back, backwards bend to the right, you twist to the right and then bend straight back. Backwards bend to the left, you twist to the left and you bend straight back. And we can get an idea of, again, do you have any yucky motions or do you not? Here's the deal. It doesn't matter if you do or not. They're all just piece of the puzzle. And we're using the location of symptoms, your story, and the response to your movement exam to just get all of the different puzzle pieces on the table so that then we can analyze them. And what we had her do is we had her go through all these different motions, just like I'm saying you can if you want. Twist right, twist left, all that stuff. And you can see that uh, she's got many different yucky motions, several yummy motions, mostly on the right side of her body. But then she uses this little scoring system to give it some numbers and objectify it. You, you can't manage what you don't measure is the idea. So this is one concept for you to take away. If you're just randomly trying a bunch of exercises and or going through your rehab uh, program, and you're not aware of how to tell uh, if what you're doing is working or not working, or how to tell week to week if you're improving or not improving and why that's meaningful to you, then you're going to be stuck. And so simply measuring things uh, as you go throughout the process is really valuable to give you an objective versus emotional read. This way you can make decisions based off the data and the logic, not the emotion of how you're feeling on the good day, on the bad day, etc. All right, so figure four left, 90. Leg raise left, 90. Back bend left, 60. Then... Record your top three pain triggers. Maybe you're watching this video and everything hurts, sort of like it did for D. But I say, look, we got to limit it to the top few. Because if you chase two rabbits, you catch none. And if you're trying to fix a million different things at one time, it's not going to go very well. So uh, sitting and driving and walking. Sitting and driving, this tells us when we go to the solution part of things that we need to first optimize that. And we need to do some detective work to figure out what about sitting and driving is part of the problem. And how can we clean that up so you can become your own best anti-inflammatory? So we're going to start here. We're not going to start with walking. We could, but we're going to start with these uh, two highest pain triggers. Now, before we get into some things below, this kind of starts to begin talking about the solution, also the diagnostics of things. But um, this is making sense. There's a match here. There's a movement pain relationship that sort of makes sense. These movements are yucky. And these activities are yucky. Now, why do I say that makes sense? Well, let's think of it like this. She has a yucky figure four, a yucky leg raise left, and a back bend left. And she has trouble with these things. Well, if you have any of these yucky motions, well, then you want to ask yourself, how are these yucky motions showing up in my life? Because it's generally what you don't know you don't know that will keep you from getting better. So, for example, she's got a yucky leg raise on her left side. Well, of course, she's going to have trouble driving because that is a yucky leg raise. And of course, doing nerve glides and doing all kinds of stretches to that left leg, in this case, under the picture of the right leg, but will not help either. It might hurt so good in the moment, but if you're getting your hamstring stretch or if you're doing lots of nerve flossing or nerve glides and you're wondering why it's not working and or why it's making you worse, it's because you have a yucky leg raise and that is a leg raise. And so sort of like a hidden picture book. These motions that are yucky show up in the triggers that are present in your life. And so we know that if we can improve these yucky motions, then we can improve your ability to live life. And that's probably what you care about. So I don't care so much about these motions and if they're yucky or if they're not. I mostly care that you start to understand and connect the dots between why if this hurts, does this hurt? And it's because that thing, this independent yucky motion, this individual yucky motion shows up and how you're doing things. Maybe in ways you didn't know you didn't know. So again, if you have a yucky knee to chest, you will have trouble if your knees are above the level of the hips. 
If you have a yucky knee to chest and you lean in at your desk because you're so in love with your work, then that is a knee to chest from above. The, the upper trunk is moving forward. A child's pose, your habits, your routines, reading in bed, squatting, the way you sleep, all that stuff, really interesting stuff. So again, if you've gone through this, ask yourself, how are these yucky motions showing up in my life? And how can I start to think about different ways to go about modifying or tweaking those things so that I can find as much comfort as possible? So again, you can't manage what you don't measure. These things are lining up, makes sense. And now we move on to the next part. Let's synthesize this and let's crack the case. So when it comes to cracking the case, obviously we've got to identify the most likely problem and have some idea of what's going on there. And then we can talk about solution. And what's interesting is that um, sometimes, and so as far as the problem, the first step when anybody submits their case that I want to be sure of is that they're in the right place and that I feel fully confident I can help. So uh, we want to rule out big, ugly, scary things, cancers, fractures, tumors, infections, blood supply problems, all that fun stuff. And I want you to know... Um, you know, if you're wondering, well, how do you do that, Charlie? You're just a physical therapist and you haven't ordered an x-ray or MRI. In this case, she did have an x-ray, but, um, you know, I, I think I want to get an x-ray or MRI just to see what's going on. Well, we have studies and we have data to suggest not only how common these issues are, but what things we need to look for in the clinical exam and in your story and all that to um, determine whether or not we need to refer out to have that ruled out. So for example, we know that of a thousand people who walk into say my office or a primary care office uh, with a complaint of back butter cytic problems, six out of a thousand people will have a tumor or cancer uh, as the cause of their symptoms. So a very low probability, probably more likely to be bitten by a shark and or get in a car accident or something like that. And we have evidence to say, hey, even if we haven't ordered an extra an MRI, just based off what they're telling us in their story and their response or lack of response to a movement exam, well, do they have these signs and symptoms? Because if so, if there's at least three out of four of these, or if there's the presence of a previous history of cancer and is not currently under observation or there hasn't been further diagnostic testing to be sure of things, then we will refer out. So if a previous history of cancer or three out of four, then we refer out for an x-ray. She's D has already had an x-ray and some blood work, maybe a, what we call erythrocyte sedimentation rate uh, to determine is there a presence of any like inflammation or something more systemic going on here. So age greater than 50, just because you're watching this, if you're over the age of 50, which D is over the age of 50, just recognize you don't need to run off and get an image. We're looking for the combination and cluster of these findings. So she's greater than 50. She does have previous history of cancer, but she's already had the x-ray, which is what we would refer out for anyways. She has no unexplained weight loss. And you could argue she's failed to respond to conservative treatment. But uh, a random sheet of exercises and or adjustments, uh, if you want to call them that, uh, is not considered uh, what I would call um, conservative treatment. That's called randomly, let's try a bunch of things and hope that it works. And you don't need a healthcare provider to do that. You can just go on YouTube and look for a bunch of random exercises uh, that would probably work maybe just as well or just as poorly. All right. So we want to take a very systematic and scientific approach. We'll talk about what that looks like. So I'm not going to put her in this category yet. I don't think she failed conservative treatment because as you'll see, I'm a conservative or natural care provider and she was able to resolve her pain naturally. So who you work with, specialist versus a generalist, matters. Again, the reason this test item cluster is so valuable for you uh, is that cancer-causing back pain can be ruled out with 100% certainty or sensitivity if the patient is less than 50, does not ex exhibit unexplained weight loss, does not have a history of cancer, and is responding to good, we'll say, uh, optimal conservative intervention. So, Dr. Charlie, do I need an extra MRI? I'm just worried because my mom had cancer, or I know a friend who had cancer. I get it. The fear of the unknown is very real. But at the end of the day, just recognize we, uh, we have some logic. Uh, we have a process for screening for these things with a high degree of, of certainty. So cancer, she doesn't have cancer. Now, fracture, there are stress reactions, stress fractures, and then there are other types of fractures. Uh, but we also are screening for things there. And this is the test cluster that we would look for. So are you a female? Males can also have fractures too, but are you a female? Age greater than 70. Of course, if you're less than 70, you can also have fractures. But again, this is the highest risk population. Significant trauma. Was there an accident, a car accident, uh, a fall off a ladder or off a curb or something like that? Uh, and, you know, is there something in your past that has significantly reduced uh, the bone density or... Um, 
potentially weaken the bones. So steroids long-term can do that. Uh, excessive use of steroid injections can do that into the spine or into other tissues. Also, history of smoking, excessive alcohol use, stuff like that. So if you're fitting these type of criteria, and again, not just one of these things, but multiple of them, if three out of four refer out, maybe fracture might be the cause. Along the same line, she doesn't really fit into this group, but female athlete triad. So younger, more athletic female, irregular period, reduced bone mineral density, eating disorders, obviously what you eat can impact your bone health, and we call positive hop tests. So we're testing for if we stress out the bones, the pelvic ring, the femur, uh, different areas, uh, and and we place load through it, we hop just on one leg, does that person get a jolt of pain to the groin, to the pelvis, to the butt? Um, almost never will you see any of these stress issues in the pelvis or the groin uh, refer below the level of the knee into the foot. So that automatically kind of excludes her because she does have some symptoms that go pretty darn low. Uh, and uh, yeah, she doesn't fit this cluster of findings. Okay. And then vascular, is this some type of vascular problem with her aorta, with her uh, other vessels in that area going down her leg, age greater than 50. What we see generally with arterial or vascular problems is that the symptoms are more exertional when you increase the load on your heart and your heart has to work hard and your muscles need a lot of blood supply and oxygen. That's when I get my symptoms versus positional. Positional will be the absence of a lot of cardiac effort. Heart isn't having to work that hard when you're just sitting or driving. And that's when she has her symptoms that are the worst. So uh, she kind of automatically excludes herself uh, from it being a vascular problem because she has problems when she's sitting and driving when her heart is not working hard versus necessarily when she's running or doing stuff like that, right? Some things to consider. So now that we've ruled out big, ugly, scary stuff for D, now we can say, all right, she's in the right place. We can potentially help her and chances are we can, but let's figure out the most likely source of her symptoms. And we're doing this just from the case review, the movement exam, the location of symptoms. This is how we sort of debunk or break down this case. So one thing you need to understand, or I would ask that you understand or be open to, is that uh, most humans are biologically wired to believe that all physical pain in their body is due to damage. It must be a disc. It must be radiculopathy, a pinched nerve, something very physical. But that's not true. And the science is pretty clear that you can experience very real physical sensations, weakness, numbness, tingling, burning, shooting, stabbing, all that stuff. It is very real. You feel it. It's right here, Charlie. It really hurts in my butt or my back or my leg. But it may not be due to a physical problem or damage in the body. It may be due to a danger response within your brain that is manifesting as physical pain or what appears to be. So the mind can mimic anything structurally. Be careful. Notice how I didn't just jump right into, oh, well, I think it's a disc problem, or I think it's a hip problem, or I think it's this, or I think it's that. We didn't go there yet. We first need to turn a big picture, brain versus body, and then if body, we can talk about that. Now, in order to help you do that, in order to help D do that, I created uh, an evidence list. And so uh, we ask most people uh, who end up working with us to go through this so that we can determine the most likely source, especially if we're not so... Sure. And I would say, hey, if you're watching this, start to answer these questions and ask yourself these questions um, as you go through it to determine for yourself what you think might be the most likely source of your symptoms. So I'll go through these questions. I have two of these side to side, not because she completed two of them, but because one thing I want you to be aware of is as you answer these questions, be very real and be very raw and authentic with yourself and honest with yourself. If you're watching this right now, you might be tempted to just click off because, oh, this guy is saying I'm crazy or it's all in my brain. No, I didn't say that. That's the story that you told yourself just for me talking about this possibility. And so it is true that both the brain and the body can cause symptoms. And oftentimes what you'll see is that people will answer these questions with a bit of a bias because they have this belief of like, okay, if the results come out, that it is of my mind, then people are going to think I'm crazy. Then I am crazy. Then it means I'm that I've wasted all this time and energy and money. And there's like this weird kind of grieving process. And I say weird. It's just uh, psychologically, it throws people for a little bit of a loop. And it's almost like they just can't quote unquote, believe it. Even if the evidence is very clear and overwhelming, people will generally do whatever they can do to uh, sort of revert back to, well, like, what about this? What about this? Or could it be this? Look at the evidence. All the pieces are on the table. Don't try to play with the evidence. Don't try to tamper with it. 
just look at it for what it is. All right. So answer these questions as best you can. All right. So the first question, are you unsure as to why your pain began? Recognize that uh, structural issues, pain caused by damage to the body, uh, there's generally a very clear reason as to why it started. You're not having to think or feel or wonder or be unsure as to what caused it. In this case, she's not sure as to what caused her symptoms. So she says, I am unsure. Oftentimes, you'll see that symptoms of the mind begin for unknown reason. Is your pain chronic, lasting longer than three to six months? We know that the body is designed to heal, and most structural uh, damage issues within the body will get better within a six-month period naturally. For example, a disc problem uh, will sort of spontaneously reabsorb, assuming you do the right things within roughly a six-month time frame. But if you're watching this right now and you've had pain for seven months, eight months, six years, 60 years, then the chance that your body just decided not to heal that specific issue in your spine, but it decided to heal everything else, all the other bumps and bruises that you received during that period would be odd, would be weird. Your body is designed to heal. And so it's not just going to pick or choose what it wants to heal versus what it doesn't. Now she says, no, my pain is not chronic, but this other evidence list here is just her answers that she wrote on her case review. So is she joshing herself? I don't know. Uh, is your pain chronic? Well, she kind of says, hey, since November 2023, uh, this is when it all began. I had some good times, bad times. But if you ask me, November 2023 to April 2024, that's quite chronic. So I'm going to answer that as a yes. I think that changes some of the probability. I think this is not as accurate as it could be. Did your pain begin during a time of fight or flight? Uh, she said no. When I say fight or flight, the reason this is useful uh, is because oftentimes uh, people don't connect the dots, but maybe your symptoms began around a time of relationship stress, good or bad or indifferent, uh, financial stress, uh, maybe career stress, uh, maybe you just had a baby uh, and that's the best thing ever, but it's still stressful. Uh, maybe you just lost a loved one, something like that, right? So did your symptoms begin around a time of fight or flight? Yes or no? She said no. Is your pain consistent? Generally, problems within the body, structural damage within the body uh, responds very consistently. On Monday, your disc doesn't decide it's going to hurt, and on Tuesday, it doesn't decide it's not going to hurt. Does stress trigger your pain? Obviously, if your symptoms are um, altered by uh, psychological dis-ease or stress, then the chance that uh, your disc is aware of if you're stressed out or not, or your SI joint knows if you're stressed or you're not, uh, probably is not very high. And then the likelihood is higher that your symptoms are of the mind. Hopefully that makes sense. Do you experience relief of your pain with distraction? I can't tell you how many people reach out to me and say, hey, Charlie, my back was really hurting. And then I went on vacation and all went away. Or on Saturday and Sunday, I feel much better. But come Sunday night, Monday morning, when I start to worry about work or have to talk to the boss, my symptoms get worse. Or hey, I went on a girl's night out or I was playing a, a pool with the boys or I was playing video games or uh, drawing or painting or doing something I was really engaged in, preoccupied by, and I didn't notice nearly as much pain. Guess what that tells you? Again, your disc doesn't know if you're happy or you're sad, if you're with the girls, if you're not with the girls, uh, it's just going to hurt. So the fact that you can experience change of your symptoms with distraction is a sign that your symptoms are more of the mind than they are the body. Okay, so she says no though. If you have pain or symptoms or problems uh, in other parts of the body, oftentimes we'll see people have uh, not only back pain, but also knee pain and shoulder pain and neck pain and uh, irritable bowel syndrome. So belly pains and migraines and headaches and all this different stuff. And what are the chances that all of those things are independent problems versus what are the chances that it's just one problem causing all of those things? Much higher, I'll tell you in my experience. Okay, so uh, does your pain shift, spread, or move around for unknown reason? This is a valuable question. She says no. Uh, because if you're watching this right now and you have pain in the right butt cheek and then, you know, a week later, now, now the right butt cheek's better, but now it's the left butt cheek, eh, it's starting to seem a little bit weird. Think of it like this. If I damage something in my right finger, I hit my right finger with a hammer, uh, I don't one day say my right finger hurts and then the next day I say, well, now my left finger hurts and now my right finger hurts. You see how it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Structural problems generally elicit pain where... Uh, that tissue was damaged, and then they might refer pain elsewhere. But it's generally not jumping or moving or shifting around, and here's the key word, for unknown reason. Do you experience delayed onset of pain, meaning you feel okay while you're doing stuff, but the symptoms come on later, and then you blame that activity from earlier as to the cause of your pain later? Uh, that's weird, uh, because if you think about it, if I damage my finger, again, whack my finger with a hammer right now, I'm going to feel pain now and later. I'm not going to say later, ow, scream out in pain. Look at my finger, it's all of a sudden bloody and swollen and say, I think it was when I hit my finger with a hammer. You see how that would not be uh, logical. 
Have you been given many or no clear diagnoses? She says, I haven't gone down the medical path. This is what she filled out. But again, I'm not sure I agree with that. If I look at her case review, which she also filled out previously, she has. She has gone to many different people. She has been given many or no clear diagnoses per se. She says right here, what do doctors, specialists believe to be the source of pain? They're not working together. So finding multiple opinions. So she has her own story as to why they're you know, disagreeing. But the point is that she has been given multiple opinions or many different diagnoses. She was first diagnosed with uh, spondylosis or arthritis with radiculopathy. We talked about how that's not true. Then a uh, general practitioner said muscle issue. She had an x-ray. Then the chiropractor says uh, locked SI joint. Then at a later point, the chiropractor said scar tissue. Nobody knows what's going on. So this is, yes, you have been given many different diagnoses and there's nothing really clear about it. She said no. Do you identify yourself as a high pressure, perfectionist, people pleaser, type A, good student, Dr. Charlie, I'll do whatever it takes. Just tell me what to do and I'll do your exercises all day, every day until I get rid of this problem. If so, yes. Why do I ask this? Because we know that people who get stuck in pain and have symptoms that are a bit more learned in nature, driven centrally by the brain versus the body, uh, live in a little bit more of a fight or flight, fix it, figure it out, problem solving state. This sort of primes the nervous system for becoming a little bit extra sensitized. This generally works well for people as it relates to their career, maybe being a good uh, parent, things like that, a good student, uh, but does not uh, serve them well when it comes to getting out of pain. Is it hard to identify yucky motions that clearly and consistently re reproduce your pain? So uh, that's a no, right? She had the yucky figure four, that yucky leg raise, and that yucky back bend. But if you are someone who went through this total body scan and you're like, you know what? I didn't have any yucky motions. I had all yummy motions. Or you know what? Like the leg raise didn't bother me now, but it bothered me later. That's delayed pain. Or I did the leg raise once and it was fine. And then another time I did the leg raise and I, you know, it, it hurt. Well, that's weird. That's not clear and consistent with regards to the response to motion. Now, she does not have an issue identifying clear and consistent yucky motion. So she said no. But um, again, if you do, then that is a sign or one clue that symptoms may be more of the mind than the body. Has there been a lack of response to physical treatment? She said, no, I don't agree that to be true. So why don't I agree with that? Because she, yes, had three PT sessions and maybe it worked temporarily, but the problem came back. So did they really solve the problem? She's currently on uh, another physical treatment, but it's taking a long time to see progress. Now she's at this pivot point. She went for chiropractic adjustments and her pain has moved and things are actually a little bit worse. Now she's going to have some class four laser sessions or whatever uh, to get rid of her scar tissues. They don't even know what it is and what they're treating. And as you'll see here in a moment, uh, we work through a very systematic physical uh, treatment process. We call it hunting for motions, a process we use to identify immediately if emotion is safe and if it's going to work for you. Uh, and she does not respond to that. And so what that tells us is that you know, if the body is the problem and if we're doing what we know how to do and we're doing it very systematically and scientifically and it's not working, then why is it not working? The lack of response to physical treatment is evidence that the physical body may not be at play. So this is the evidence list. And again, this is what she filled out as she started to learn about some of this stuff. And you can see she may have biased it a little bit. I know it's of the body, Charlie. All right. Well, that's not what you indicated on your case review, because I just copied and pasted these things. And now we're starting to look a little bit more 50-50. We're a little bit more on the fence. Huh. You can also see here that I am not sure. I'm even on the fence early in the process when she started the program with us. Hey, D, symptoms most consistent with a structural source at this time. Most consistent. Diagnostics occur in probabilities. It is slightly more consistent and biased towards it being a structural problem, problem of the body, but only at this time based off the evidence that we have at this time, but it's subject to change and we may collect some evidence which proves otherwise. Right? So kind of a cool case because I'm on the fence, but let's just say it is of the body and she is correct. You know, she's got, uh, she's got these yucky motions, figure four left, the leg raise left, all these different things. This is where she hurts. She, you know, she thinks it's from working out. She has trouble bending over. What does that sound like, Charlie? Well, let's figure it out. We go into the DIY diagnostic guide and we go into this diagnostic algorithm. We start with, do you have pain in your back, butter leg? Of course we do. We go to the top here. Yes, I have back pain with or without leg pain, numbness or tingling. Okay. And does her pain body diagram, the location of symptoms, does it match this? Or does it match this? Well, it matches more of this because she's got symptoms that go below the level of the knee 
towards the foot. And here, that does not involve symptoms below the level of the knee. And so that tells us something. So then we say, okay, yes. And I say, try this. And remember, she already tried this. You can try this at home. If you've been led to believe you have sciatica, well, what we know is that we can be 95% sure that if you do not have this as a yucky motion, that sciatica is not likely the source of your symptoms or that you don't have sciatica, that you don't have sensitivity to stretching or pulling on the sciatic nerve. So if you don't have a yucky leg raise, we can be very certain as a screening test that sciatica can be ruled out. Diagnostic is about ruling things in and ruling things out and shifting probabilities. It's not black and white. Yikes, that hurts. That did cause D's pain and maybe it caused your pain. Sciatica, what could be causing it? There are many different causes. The most common would be a disc issue. So maybe they were right. Maybe they weren't. Not with radiculopathy, but maybe there is an L5-S1 problem. And the reason I say that is because then based off the location of her symptoms, you saw that drawing and I'm sure you have a location of symptoms that you can relate to here. Uh, she doesn't have any pain in the front of her thigh. She does have pain in the back of her thigh, but not in the front. So it's not L3. It's very rare, by the way. L4 nerve issue. She doesn't have any pain in the front of the leg. So again, it can be ruled out only in the back of the leg. L4 can cause pain in both. L5, again, nothing really in the front of the leg, only the back. So L5, pretty darn common to have an issue with, but this seems to be most consistent. It's on one side and it's just going down the back of the leg. There's nothing in the front of the leg. So if we had to put a body or a structural diagnosis based off this mind versus body, evidence list, listening to the story, location of symptoms, all this cool stuff, right? We would say L5, S1, disc herniation, protrusion, this, that could be many different things within that but affecting the S1 nerve root. And you can see there are other signs and symptoms, uh, none of which I'm privy to after reviewing her case review in isolation, but oftentimes uh, symptoms will be in the center of the low back. There'll be trouble going from a sitting to a standing position, coughing, sneezing, all this stuff will make it, make it worse. First thing in the morning, because disc pressure is highest, it'll be worse, so on and so forth. And again, if you want access to this uh, for yourself, just download that DIY diagnostic guide. So that is the most likely source of her symptoms, if of the body, but we're still on the fence. So now, Charlie, what do we do? We've ruled out big, ugly, scary. We're not so sure. How do we begin treating this? We follow a process. So let's talk about the solution, which is very much a part of cracking the case. Again, sometimes the fixing is in the doing. Lots of people reach out to me. They want to know, just tell me the exercise to do. What's going on with me? Uh, th this is... This would be a liken to, you know, being a, a crime scene investigator. I always loved those shows growing up. And instead of going through the investigation and being willing to go to the scene and collect the clues and lay them out on the table and connect the dots and really put some effort into thinking about what could be going on here, to come up with a story and a narrative that actually makes sense, people like to skip that. And so what I want you to realize is that the fixing is in the doing. And Part of the process of figuring this out is to go through the process, collect the clues, and then it starts to reveal the truth. And this is the pain relief process that we teach to people all around the world dealing with these issues. So step one, we optimize the healing environment. The analogy is pretty straightforward. You can't out-exercise the bad diet. If you want to do exercises and that's what you're here for, and you want to know what the magic exercise is, there is nothing magic about the exercises that we're about to talk about today. Um, there is magic in the process, this process. And notice I don't start with movement as medicine because you can take all the best medicine, all the best exercises and motions. If you're constantly picking the scab mentally or physically, you will be frustrated and it will not work, guaranteed. So optimizing the environment, what does that look like? Well, for D, she had trouble. This is the power of, again, going back to uh, measuring things. She had trouble with sitting and driving and walking. So the first thing we need to do is figure out why is sitting and driving a problem? How can we start to uh, tweak or modify the way she's sitting, the way she's driving to determine what her body prefers or what it doesn't so she's not constantly picking the scab? First, we do that first. Belief system, just by her filling out this evidence list, she begins to open her mind to the possibility that, huh, maybe this isn't what I thought it was. Maybe there's something else at play here. And so she starts to become a little bit more open-minded. She starts to kind of challenge some of her stories and her belief systems. And then she feels confident because we have a process for ruling out these big, ugly, scary things. Huh, I don't have to be afraid anymore. The more we reduce the fear, the more we reduce the reaction, the more we start to lower her fight or flight reaction, the more symptoms might start to resolve just naturally. And so very powerful. We talk about not only the brain, but the body in the optimization phase. This next step we talked about a little bit already is you self-assessing and you measuring 
so that you can manage and make decisions week to week on the data, not the emotion of what you think or you feel or a good day or bad day or whether it's sunny or it's cloudy out. You can see here, there is no question that what she's doing is working. And so if you've been told, hey, just try these exercises and you know it could take a month for you to see a change to get your glutes stronger and we think that's the cause of your pain, run the other way because you should see because you should be able to see an immediate change and there should be no question as to if what you're doing is working. And then you wanna understand, well, why are they measuring that leg raise range of motion? Why are they taking that little measurement device and checking how well things are moving? Uh, why does that matter to me? Because these things show up in life and that's why it matters because you wanna get back to life, right? Great, so if we improve these things, you can see her scores here, they go down. These things go down in unison or in direct proportion to those things to the yucky motions getting better, right? So self-assessment gives us an idea diagnostically what could be going on, but also helps us measure things and objectify things. So we get a baseline. And then step three, mind and movement is medicine. The goal is never to take more medicine than needed, it's to take as little as necessary. If we think of movement as medicine, the same would ring true. Why do a sheet of things when you can do one thing? And so we teach you a process we call hunting for motion. So identify the one motion you need to do to solve the problem. And then finally, we need to get you back to life so that you're feeling safe and you have all the tools to best prevent this in the future. So we talked about optimization, what that looked like. We talked to her and helped her understand that, hey, you've got these yucky leg raises. And then how is that showing up in your life? Maybe we want to be thinking about cutting some of these things out and or changing the way we do some of this stuff. Awesome. We talked about the belief system, mind versus body, and what pain really is all about and what it means and why she can't solve her problem. She's opened up her mind to a different way of solving it. We've self-assessed, and now we can use the results of that self-assessment to find a motion that works. Here's what it looks like. On the 20th of April, week and a half or so after she started the process, she took one of her yucky motions, and she scored it and objectified. She did it one time. And then... We helped her identify so that she knew what to do motion or exercise wise. We helped her identify what we call a pain pattern. So I found after doing this thousands of times that people generally based off the location or symptoms, their story, uh, and then what makes them feel better or worse as far as response to movement exam, that people generally fall into one of four pain patterns. And there's nothing, again, magical about these pain patterns. Um, but we realized that you can only move the body so many different ways, forward, backwards, right, left, twist it, right, and left. And so when we get to this point in the process where we're looking to use movement as medicine, we need to know where to start. Dr. Charlie, what motion should I do to resolve the problem? Well, you can only move the body forward, backwards, right, left, and then twist it right and left. So northeast, south, and west, and then rotation. And so based off the location of symptoms, her story, uh, and the response of her movement exam, uh, she fell into pain pattern number three. I found after doing this thousands of times that people fall into one of four pain patterns. So we would help you identify your pain pattern, which determines where we want to begin. And so we found that she would likely best respond to or would want to start testing motions uh, that involve rotation of the lower body. And so you'll see here, I just want to highlight the fact there's nothing magical about these exercises. So many people reach out to us and say, you know, I, I want to see what exercises you're going to provide to me, because if I already tried them, then then I don't know how you can help me. Hopefully you can see that this goes way beyond just exercise to solve this problem. It's really, really in depth on the back end. I'm just sharing all of my logic. So you can see that I'm very transparent about how we solve this. And if you want help too, potentially we could help you do that. But there's nothing magical about the exercises. What's magical is the process that you use to determine what's going to work for you. That's the difference. So you might be doing clamshells and have tried clamshells, but have you been doing them with 10 other exercises? If so, Maybe it would have worked. Maybe it wouldn't have worked. And maybe nine of the exercises were making you worse and the clamshell would have made you better, but you don't know because you didn't test it in isolation. And maybe the clamshell wouldn't have made you better on the left side, but maybe just the right side would have worked. And maybe you did reps, but maybe holds work better. And do you see how specific we think of movement as medicine? We can get, we go from all these possible movement options. We help you identify a pain pattern, get you in the ballpark of here's the things that we want you to begin testing. And within that, we highlight not only the one exercise, but the one side you need to do it on. And if you prefer reps versus holds versus something else. How cool and scientific is that? And so we tested a yucky motion. This is the hunting motions process. This yucky motion comes from up here. We did one rep of it on this day. Ouch, 30, yucky. Great. We're going to start here giving your pain pattern. Nothing, same. Let's try it in a different way. Same. Nothing. Boom. Next motion. Next motion. Next motion. We keep going until finally she says, ah, I think this makes me a wee bit better. The center back bend drop in the opposite of a press up. And so then she takes that motion. She uses it as medicine and you see she's striked out a lot, but she starts to send me these questions. And I was like, huh. 
This is very telling. And you'll see around uh, end of April, early May is when we really start to make a change as to how we're viewing this. And we really start to collect some evidence which suggests maybe symptoms aren't as much of the body and maybe they're more of the mind. Huh? He says, Charlie, today is day four with adding the first motion from pain pattern number three, that one we just talked about. What is next? So I continue through the remaining motions on the list to find another as yummy and results in a better score. You can sense the urgency, which is fine to be urgent when you're in pain, but uh, you can sense that she's really trying to be a good student and move through this process and do what's right. Why do I say do what's right? I want to make sure it's the best approach. Hey, I've taken your suggestions and continued with that for an additional four days to collect more data. Today is day eight, minimal improvement. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to make sure I'm not messing this up. Good student, hypervigilant catastrophization coming out worry fear doubt concern it's growing and you can see it growing throughout these messages i'm checking back on the above question any thoughts i've been doing the same for 11 days now dang it when should i do another you shouldn't do another you should stick to the process and the fact that you're frustrated by this hunting promotions process and you're not responding to physical motion is starting to tell us there's something else funky going on d then she lands this on me just tell me what to do is there a way to pick a motion just tell me where to go, Charlie. That will better target the highest score from the yucky motions. I'm getting frustrated is what she's saying. And I say this. If you mean pick a motion, as in consciously try to predict basically what she's going to respond to, the answer is likely no. I've tried and gotten lucky before, but usually end up getting there just as fast by following the process. And I would say even faster. Pain patterns get you in the ballpark. Then testing reveals the truth. There's a lot of... Um, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that statement. It's not because I just said it. Just break that down. You might be going to someone because you expect that there's something magical about what they know or what they do in the sense of, hey, if I have this problem and I have pain here, just tell me the exercise to do. There's nothing good or bad about a specific motion. All motions are neutral in and of themselves until proven to be valuable for you. Because what might work for D and all of her story and location of symptoms, you could have the identical story as D, and you might not respond to the motion that she responds to. And so I'm a big believer in dropping all belief systems around specific motions and treatments and just testing. And so let the process expose the truth and the value of independent motions and the value of any specific treatment. In this case, our process, hopefully someone or whoever you're working with has a process. Ask them what their process is. Ask them how, when somebody comes in with this issue, do you systematically and scientifically solve it? If they're changing their process every single time, if some days they work with you hands-on and the next day you go on the bike, and other days you, you start in the corner on ice and then you get hands-on treatment when they're ready. They've already botched the process. The process changed. They will not be able to identify any pain pattern. So if you have a certain belief or fear or worry, concern, or thought about I have stenosis, so I shouldn't do back bends, but I should do four bends. I have a disc problem, so four bends are bad, right? And back bends are good. I have an SI joint problem. I need to strengthen my glutes, or I don't need to strengthen my glutes. Whatever you have in your brain right now, what I'm saying is drop it. Let this process of testing, treating, retesting show you the way. And she says, okay, good to know. I was hoping you had some super algorithm in your bag of tricks. There are no tricks. There are only concepts and first principles. There is only a process, and the super algorithm is the process, and you can't beat the algorithm, all right? So consider that. Trust the process. If you follow the pain relief process, pain relief naturally follows because it tells you what to do. The fact that she was going through all these different motions and was not responding and sending me all that stuff and hyper-focused on just tell me what to do, it's not working, I'm getting frustrated exposed to me even more evidence, which allowed me to get off the fence. Meaning you see here, the unclear, inconsistent, or lack of response to this hunting for motions, very scientific systematic process that we just talked about, is further evidence and gives me a lot of conviction and faith in believing that, huh, this is happening for a reason. She doesn't like the fact that she's going through all these motions and is not responding because she just wants to figure it out. But the fact that she's not responding is actually the best thing that could happen to her because without the lack of response, she wouldn't be willing potentially or able to have the belief and conviction in another way of viewing her problems in the fact that maybe her symptoms are not of the body. Maybe they are of the mind. So if you're not responding to physical treatment, that is a clue.
And unfortunately, some folks, especially folks who are very glued to the diagnostics and the images and the results of all that stuff, and I know there's a problem here and I know there's a problem there, and they're a bit dismissive of the mind stuff and or unaware of it, is they'll just beat themselves down and they'll keep going through all these motions only to find that nothing works, things work temporarily and or things make them worse. And so essentially there's no response. And so if you think of it, you know, if the body is the problem, something about the body via this systematic process, some input of the body, forward, backwards, right, left, rotation, right side, left side, holds versus rep, should change your symptoms and be the solution. But if it's not, then you need to call into question the origin of your symptoms. As frustrating as this is for people, if you never fall off the bike, you never learn how to ride it. And so this is likened to the way that some people need to fall off the bike. They need to keep falling off the bike and seeing something's not working, something's not working. Ah, that means I need to go a different way. If the brakes are the problem, folks, last analogy, and you go to 10 different mechanics and they all replace your brakes and you still have the same squeak, then guess what? The squeak was not due to the brakes. You told yourself or believed that your brakes were squeaking. That's a story you told yourself or someone else told you. But now they fix the brakes over and over and over again, and your car is still squeaking. It was never the brakes to begin with. And at some point, you must challenge that belief system and say, maybe it's not the brakes, but there's still a squeak. Could it be something else? Could it be the mind? Then we gather more evidence. On the 1st of May, about a month, not quite three weeks after she started the process, she's already moving in the right direction as evidenced by what we're measuring. Three weeks in, you can see significantly better already. I say to her, hey, You've got a lot of evidence. What do you think about this? She said, yeah, I'm starting to kind of maybe think there's something funky going on. Not of the body as much as she thought. Remember, she said 85-15. I showed her the evidence list. I said, hey, it's kind of more 50-50. And oh, you're not responding to these motions. What do you make of this? Why do you think that's happening? Hey, I think there might be something funky going on. I said, I think there's something funky going on too. You're avoiding sitting and all these different things because you believe that you're damaging your body you feel the pain and then you tell yourself a story oh my gosh it could be this it could be that you have more fear you have more worry you have more concern when i sit what's wrong with me i'm afraid i sit less i move less there's more fear there's more pain you're stuck in a negative feedback loop and so let's do this let's completely change our approach to solving this the story unfolds instead of banging up against this back bend let's try a totally different motion let's just start from scratch let's do the leg raise that shows up in the way you're driving and the way you're sitting do it once for me d 50. Take a yucky motion. Then I say, you know what? Let's do something really funky. All the motions on your right side, for the most part, are yummy. All the motions on your right side, for the most part, are yummy. Again, we go back to here. Say so figure four right is yummy. Leg raise right is yummy. Twister. We got all kinds of yummy things that we could potentially try on. So then what we do is I say, the other cool thing about the figure four right, which we're going to try here in a moment, is that it's completely sort of unrelated, if you will, meaning it's on the complete opposite side. And so let's do it. Let's try it on. It's yummy. Let's do three, uh, three reps of 30-second holds into that figure four kind of piriformis stretch. And then what I want you to do is I want you to retest that leg raise. And wow, Charlie, that's worked better than any of the other things I've tried so far. What's that about? And so what do you think that's about? I said, how is it that stretching your right leg in a figure four position improved your left leg raise? And she's like, well, I don't really understand. And I was like, well, I don't really understand either. Now, that being said, the right leg is in the same body as the left leg. So it's possible physically you could have pulled on something or done something structurally, but probably not. Probably what we did is we just helped you reduce your fear. We just started to teach you that you can do movements and you can use movement as a tool versus a weapon. You can find safe movements as an entry point to a sensitive nervous system. And instead of doing all kinds of junk that just hurts and makes you worse, and trying to fight or fend off this pain, let's instead just do a motion that feels safe. And let's do it on the right side of your body, complete opposite side of your body. And then let's retest. And wow, is it possible that just doing any motion, Charlie, that feels good could help improve my symptoms? Well, maybe, but we tested this 1D and what we found is it was safe and it immediately improved your leg raise. So it's a win. This motion, for whatever reason, probably more here than physically in the body, seems to immediately improve your movement experience or your leg raise. Great, done. We bottle that up and now you have a prescription. You can do 330 reps three times a day at a specific time during the day when you notice you're going to have your symptoms. Timing of the medicine is very important. And then that's what we're going to do. So it's the one motion. So just recognize that even if symptoms are of the mind, you can still use movement as a way to retrain your reaction to movement. You can still use safe, yummy motions and exercise 
to make yourself feel more confident, less fearful, less concerned. So you move more. The more you move, the better you feel. And to aid in changing your reaction to pain. So that's what we do. We said, hey, you've been trying to fight this thing or fend this thing off, going through all these different motions, getting frustrated. You've been doing this for weeks. You're, uh, you're now opening your eyes to maybe a different cause of symptoms. Instead of trying to fix the pain, instead of being stuck in fix it or figure it out or problem solving mode, why don't we just work to change your reaction to symptoms? Here's the cool thing. This works whether your symptoms are of the body or of the mind. About 50% of the people we work with have symptoms that are very clearly due to some structural damage, a disc herniation, disc extrusion, spinal stenosis, facet joint problems, piriformis syndrome, arthritis, stuff like that. The other 50% of people, maybe someone like D, have symptoms that are more of the mind. And sometimes it's not clear up front. You have to go through the process to actually figure it out and weed through it. So we say, let's change your reaction to pain. This is very important. Again, regardless of your symptoms, the more reaction you have to symptoms, the more fearful, worry, concern, catastrophizing, meaning worry, doubt, research mode, all that stuff, it's not going to help you solve it faster. It's actually going to slow down your healing journey. So I said, hey, when you sit next time, right now, when you sit, you believe that damage, not danger, is the cause of your symptoms. But now we want, we've gone through this and you have some alternative evidence and now you're more open-minded to the process. Is it possible that there is no physical damage, but instead your brain's making a bit of a mistake and it's telling you there's danger. It's creating real physical symptoms, but there actually is none. It's perceived. Huh. This is weird, Charlie. So can we work on improving your sitting tolerance so that we can tip the scale towards safety? mentally and physically. So again, pain is an experience of the brain and the body. Hopefully you've seen so far with this case review that uh, we need to consider both. They are very intimately connected. And unless you have someone who is really sharp orthopedically, as well as psychologically, as far as understanding this uh, brain pain, body pain connection, this negative feedback loop that you see here, you could be stuck. And so generally what happens is something starts in your body when you're sitting, when you're bending, when you're lifting, when you're twisting, when you're at the gym, something like that. And then regardless of the cause, structural or not, your brain becomes a bit reactive, goes into fight or flight mode, protection mode. What's wrong with me? Oh my gosh, let me get the x-ray. Let me give the MRI. More fear, more worry. Let me not do anything, Charlie, until I get the results of my MRI. Bad idea. More fear, more worry, more pain. Boom, 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 you're stuck. So I said, hey, the next time you sit, when you're sitting, instead of reacting to your symptoms and looking for the softest seat in the room or getting up as soon as you notice something, what if you were to sit there and observe your symptoms rather than react to your symptoms, as long as they're tolerable. And you know what? Uh, what she did is something really, uh, really smart. She started to sit, felt the soreness. Now with the education and having faith and understanding what she knows, she started to say, maybe I'm not damaged and maybe this is a bit of a mistake. Okay, I'm going to observe it. And then she started to link positive experiences with her experience of sitting, which in the past had been negative or bad. She started sitting down and eating her favorite foods. She started sitting down and enjoying her favorite movies and giving herself permission to sit and experience some of the symptoms. Then she started to sit longer. Again, the fixing is in the doing. Had she not gone through this whole process, she would have never had the belief or conviction that she needed to actually go full in on the process and to trust the process. So now she's starting to trust the process a bit more because she's like, this is actually kind of working. And I know it's working, Charlie, because I'm measuring. And now that I'm measuring and I'm going through and I'm seeing all the evidence, I'm not just guessing, I'm testing. And I'm doing that one motion, that figure four on the right side to help my left leg raise. And I'm sitting longer and I'm starting to disassociate sitting with pain. I'm starting to break that position pain relationship. And now I can sit a little bit longer. Huh, this is getting better. Maybe sitting isn't harming my body. More movement, more sitting. Less fear, more safety while sitting. I'm sore, but I'm safe. And before you know, in an eight to 10 week time frame, she was able to avoid the MRI, avoid pills, avoid shots, avoid surgery, uh, because someone did not have the understanding of both the brain and the body, and or someone did not take enough time to really break it down for her like we did. So you can see she's pain-free here, uh, and was able to resolve her pain naturally. None of that other stuff needed. Final checkpoint here inside the process that she shared, I just want to share with you. It's time to get back to life, and I've been doing just that. There is hope for all those who are starting this program. When I first joined, I couldn't sit, walk, put on a sock, tie my shoes. Eight weeks later, I've traveled and sat through two of my daughter's college graduation ceremonies, traveled to see my son's baseball team win their high school regional championship, take my dog on long walks on her favorite trail, and just yesterday, tied my left shoe instead of slipping it on, celebrating all the small wins. That is what it's about. I don't care about these individual motions. I care. These individual motions might show up in life. I don't care about this measurement system, but without a measurement system, you're not going to get there. All right. So recognize that as somebody who deeply cares about helping people, we need a few elements to figure out what's going on. 
We need to review your case. We need to know where you hurt, location or symptoms. We need to know the details of your story. We need to have you work through this process of testing uh, to determine which motions feel good and don't feel good. We need to help you identify via uh, some work here and some deep detective work um, what the evidence suggests. Then within that, we can go down the body side or we can go down the brain side. And then we need to recognize that the only way to solve the problem is to follow a proven process rather than just randomly doing things and mixing this whole thing up. Right? If an electrician comes out and they don't turn off the power one day and then they start doing work versus the next day, they decide they should shut off the power, et cetera, that person's going to be zapped. And I would hate to see you get zapped by the lack of process in the treatment approach. Right? So um, the process works if you work the process just some good old-fashioned detective work using multiple elements of your story to solve the problem. All right, so hopefully this case review was valuable. And even if your case wasn't exactly like D's, hopefully you could relate to some of it. And uh, if you have some type of back butt or sciatica problem, recognize the same concepts still apply. You must optimize the healing environment mentally and physically. You must break some beliefs potentially to solve the problem. And you must start to identify the habits or the routines that are keeping you from getting better. That being said, you can't manage what you don't measure. You must be willing to self-assess and track progress so that you know what you're doing is working, not working, or a waste of time. Then we must use movement as medicine. One motion, not a million motions. Otherwise, how do you know if what you're doing is working or not working? And how can you feel confident getting you know, shots or surgery knowing that you just did a random shoot of exercises? I wouldn't expect that to work. And then finally, we talk about prevention, getting you back to full speed, just like we did for D. And so if you're interested in working with us, just click the apply link uh, somewhere in the description and then follow instructions to submit that case review. And then let me know in the comments, was this helpful? What did you learn? Thanks so much, everyone. Chat soon.